That I think I said I meant to you before we left. And the way you move in the summertime, all those things that refuse to shine above. That I think I said I meant to you before we left. And the way you move in the summertime, all those things that refuse to shine above. Full is what I think. That's why 
I decide to make you drink around our food Baby, you Come feed me sometimes Not every time Now the time Hey, I wanna take a flight There's a risk that I might have seen We're flying too low But come on, let's go for a rip There's a chance that we'll Sometimes, not every time And you Complete me sometimes It's not the time for you Ooh. Complete me sometimes It's not the time Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Future Plymouth. I hope you've missed us. Uh, this is episode 11, an urban design in a post-COVID world. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. As usual, we have a really great lineup again for you this afternoon. Uh, first up, we have uh, Nikki Reid, uh, and she's urban designer for Plymouth City Council. Uh, she's going to talk us through the Healthy Streets Initiative and how important it is for the quality of external places between our buildings that has become so important to us after the COVID pandemic. And secondly, we have our first double act, Steve Warren Brown, and also uh, Adam King of YGS Landscapes. And they're going to talk us to about us uh, about uh, urban deforestation. And then our second double act, it will be Tess Wilmot and Ian Smith from Food Plymouth, who will explain the theories and local actions in uh, permaculture and urban farming. Uh, so, as usual, we also have a, a Q&A session at the end of the programme. So please stick around for that and raise your hand to ask a question live to our panellists. Or if you prefer, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen uh, and type your question in. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Nicola Reid. Over to you, Nicola. Hello. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um... and play. That's working great Nicola. Great, thank you very much. So hi everybody, um, my name's Nikki Reid. Um, I'm an architect and urban designer for Plymouth City Council. Um, I'm also a Healthy Streets practitioner. I live in Plymouth and I'm really interested in cities and people and the impact we all have in challenging the built environment to really put people at the heart of our city. Um, to start, I'd just like you to think about the fact that in urban areas, streets typically make up for 80% of public space. And actually the vast majority of public transport, of transport in general, happens in these public spaces. Um, I think that's really important to consider, um, irrespective of whether we're living in a pre or post COVID world. But I really think over the last year, we've certainly taken our incidental local public spaces a lot less for granted, and we value them a lot more. I think many places are adapting streets in ways that are helping to promote health and well-being, both for this crisis and really as a long-term solution. Um, I think just if we could think a bit for a minute about the way in which our cities and towns and street environments impact on our health and well-being. 
So I think this pandemic has really amplified structural inequalities, inequities and pre-existing socioeconomic disparities across communities. I think we would like for transportation and built environment specialists to use streets to start to charter a healthier and more equitable course for the future. And I think this is all related to how we manage motorised road transport, which is really the root cause of the positive and negative health impacts of our streets and transport systems. And this is really the starting point of healthy streets. Um, so the five biggest impacts of the streets and transport systems on health are on this slide. So if we start on the right, you can see severance. So this is the issue of people not being able to easily get from where they are to where they want to go. It could be something really simple, like a crossing point not being in the place where people need it to be, or a really big busy road that severs communities from interacting with one another. Or it could be really high level, so people don't have the things they need to access on a regular basis within a short accessible distance. So next to it's noise. Um, noise impacts on our health in terms of our children's development. It affects us all in terms of our ability to sleep and perform at work. And research is actually showing that some cardiovascular impacts are being increasingly recognised in terms of noise too. Um, air quality is next, and I think this is something we're all likely to be familiar with, and it's probably pretty topical today. Um, obviously, this impacts on our cardiovascular and pulmonary systems and can even affect unborn babies. And uh, next in the line is road traffic injuries. They're obviously quite a serious issue, and uh, not just for the person who might be injured, but also their wider community. And perhaps most importantly, I think, road traffic injuries also link to the last of those five, which is physical activity, because the fear of being injured on the street is one of the biggest factors in people choosing not to walk and cycle more. And physical activity is something we all need every day to stay healthy and to prevent a wide range of long term health conditions. <clears throat> Here we have a super cheerful graph um, of the top causes of illness and early death amongst the population. And you can see low physical activity down at number 13 and air quality at number nine. So out of those five impacts we've just talked about, two of them are right up there as top causes of illness and early death. This is really interesting, I think, when you think about all of the factors that have an influence on the health of people. We actually all have the ability to do something about number 13, physical activity, because incidental physical activity is hugely influenced by the way we use our streets, the form of our cities and our towns and our transport management. So I think that's really quite significant. But physical activity actually isn't just at number 13. Physical activity also influences all these other things shown in pink further up the graph. So whether or not you're regularly managing to do a small amount of activity like walking or cycling a day, just 20 minutes will really influence your likelihood of suffering from some of the other conditions on this graph. So I actually consider physical activity to be the biggest impact out of those five. So like I said, roughly 20 minutes a day is a recommended physical activity for adults. That's not a lot. In the UK at the moment, only about 50% of adults are managing this minimum level of physical activity. And that's a reflection of the environment we're living in. Children, as you can see, need more exercise. They need 60 minutes a day. And the statistics are the same. And I think that's really sad. I think not only are we impacting ourselves with our choices and our environment, but our kids as well. Just going back to those impacts for a minute, air pollution was discussed at number nine, number nine, and obviously there are other things that contribute to this, but motorised transport obviously has a significant contribution to that too. Road traffic injuries also feature in this graph under number six, um, but these are just the road traffic injuries caused by somebody who is intoxicated, killing or injuring themselves or somebody else while driving. So all in all, transport and street environments have quite a significant impact on health. And I think if we can shift the way we think about them, we can really have quite a transformative effect on the well-being and quality of life of people. Hopefully, seeing this graph um, and seeing how much of it's coloured really helps explain to you guys a bit about why public health and the transport sector are so linked. So healthy streets approach is a public health approach and it sets out 10 indicators developed from an evidence base for the impact of the built environment on health inequalities and travel choices. And this means that at the centre of this approach are the primary goals of the health community, so healthy environment and healthy behaviours, and the transport community. So that's using the most efficient mode of transport suited for each trip. What we as healthy streets practitioners would like 
is that when we're making decisions about how we use our street spaces and how we plan our cities is that we think about these 10 things. And if we can do that, we will get better outcomes for people and better places for us all to live in. I'm going to briefly go through each of these um, 10 indicators, explain a bit about them and show a few examples. So easy to cross. Our streets need to be easy to cross for everybody. And this is important because people prefer to be able to get where they want to go directly and quickly. So if we make that difficult for them, they'll just get frustrated and give up. This is called severance. Um, we've already spoken about that briefly and it has real impacts on our health, on our communities and on businesses too. It's not just physical barriers and lack of safe crossing points that cause severance, but it can actually be the fear of fast moving traffic as well. Um, these are both examples from Valencia in Spain, where through the design of the street, pretty cheap bit of paint, they've made it very clear through size and a bit of creativity that in this particular location, the priority here is for the people who are trying to cross that street. And this really changes the priority and perception from people driving as being the most important to the pedestrians being the most important. Uh, shade and shelter. So this is important for health and well-being, of course. It protects us from the sun and rain and wind, makes streets a lot more pleasant environments for people to spend time. Um, shade and shelter can come in many forms, trees, awnings, colonnades. I quite like this example from Chicago because it shows that healthy streets are not just the result of one single agency. It's like a collective I'm action. So so the slides are lagging, actually. I think they seem to be frozen. Oh, so really? OK. So what, what are you up to? 10 healthy streets indicators. Oh, really? OK, right. Let's see if I can go back a bit. Maybe it just needs reopening. Has that helped at all? I'll start, I'll start again. I'll turn your screen sharing off and if you could share again, we'll try and restart. Yep. OK. Excellent. If you could uh, share your screen again, we'll try that again. Yep, no problem. <laughs> Computer says no, Nick. <laughs> What's that? Computer says no. Computer says no. Technology, <laughs> hey. Right. Uh, am I flicking through? No. No. It still oh. says you're sharing. I'm not sharing. Um, okay, I'm not sharing. <laughs> Perhaps I'm good at that, not sharing. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm lucky. Let's give you one more go. Sorry, everyone, we'll get back in a second. Am I sharing something? Anything? Nothing. Really it's weird. Starting to, it's starting to share, Nick. It's trying. Bear with it. You got anything yet? Nothing yet. <laughs> how, how large is the file, Nick? Is it possible to email it to Miles? Maybe. Um... What we'll do, Nicola, I know it's a real pain, but we'll, we'll um, if you could email me your presentation and we'll... Yeah, of course. We'll skip to... Um, uh, Adam and Steve, and yep. we'll come back to you after Adam and Steve. Yep, no problem. Is that all right? Yeah, of course. Let me just email it to you. So I'm going to bring up Adam and Steve early. Uh, they're from uh, YGS Landscapes. Are you prepared, guys? Are you there? There they are. Can you hear us okay? Oh, that's better, that's better. Are Brilliant. you okay to go next? Yeah, not a problem. I haven't had time to get my tie and get finished dressed. Oh, now. Yeah. I'm right tis. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> right yeah we'll, we'll um, we're, we're not going to invite you again steve <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Okay, right. well, we'll leave that with you, Adam, Adam King and Steve Von Brown. Thanks, Miles. We will uh, move straight on to uh, our presentation. Just bear with us. So can, can you all see that? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Excellent. So yeah, welcome to our presentation this afternoon. It's about urban afforestation and microforests. So you get a two for one offer today. You get myself, my name's Adam King. And my, night, my name's Steve Warren Brown. So let's move straight on. So why do we need trees? So not only are they stunning lamp forms, but their benefits extend way beyond their natural beauty. So trees provide us with an oxygen rich environment. They are masters at absorbing carbon and they can absorb as much as 22 kilograms a year. Their leaves filter the air, they remove particles and absorb pollutant gases such as nitrogen oxides, ammonia and sulfur dioxides. Just looking at trees reduces workplace stress. It decreases the recovery time of hospital patients and can even lower the amount of criminal activity. A single mature oak tree can provide habitat for over 280 species. Um, Nikki mentioned shelter and shade, but a deciduous tree can provide shade in summer, but allow winter sun to warm buildings they are basically nature's bris soleil. So trees also absorb water, but through engineering solutions, we can even design tree pits in urban areas as part of a sustainable urban drainage system where they can attenuate water and reduce flash floods. They have architectural functions. They can frame key views and they can mitigate unsightly ones and they have massive economic benefits. Mature trees have been shown to increase the value of property. And if you add in the value of the environmental functions they perform, it has been estimated that trees are worth 6.5 billion pounds a year, simply in terms of re reducing flood damage alone, which is pretty incredible. Phytoremediation is another, uh, another thing trees can do. They can mop up soil pollutants such as chrome, zinc and lead. So as you can see, trees are really useful. So how can we get the maximum benefits from trees within our cities? There are many opportunities for greening our cities. However, the concept we'd like to talk about today is that of microforests. Now, microforests, they're not a new um, concept. They're actually developed by this gentleman here, Dr. Miyawaki, in the 1970s, and over 2,000 have been planted to date. So what are the benefits of microforests? Well, you can achieve a woodland in about 30 years. Normally it takes about 200, so that's a, a, a pretty big tick. Growth rates can be five times faster. They can absorb 30 times more carbon. They can attract more than 500 species of animals and plants, and they can process 30,000 litres of rainfall. And all this in a piece of land the size of a tennis court, eight metres by 10 metres. So how do you create a microforest? Well, what you've got to do is start with the basics, and that is always good design. The design needs to replicate a natural ecosystem. So you're creating all the layers you'd get in the natural woodland, and preferably you'd use native trees. So you can see in this slide, you've got the shrub layer, you've got the, the smaller trees, medium sized trees, and then the canopy layer, the really big guys right at the top there. So you create this natural system. The next part of the concept is brilliantly simple. It's the way that you plant your trees. So traditionally, trees are planted at about 1.5 to 2 meter centers. They've got plenty of light, 
they've got water, they've got nutrients. The trees are nice and relaxed, very happy and grow at a nice steady pace. So in the Miyawaki forest, what do we do? Well, we plant them much closer, as close as 400 millimeters. They are forced to fight for resources, light, water and nutrients. And in doing so, they grow at a much faster rate. So how can we apply these principles to Plymouth? There are a number of policy documents out there already. So we've got the Plymouth Plan, we've got the Plymouth Plan for Trees, and we've got the Joint Local Plan. Okay, all these policy documents generally say the same thing. We need to protect, conserve, and enhance our tree stock. The Plan for Trees states that we should be aiming for about 20% tree cover in Plymouth but in some wards we are as low as 5.8%. So clearly we have a long way to go. They also talk about the importance of green infrastructure. This always works best for the environment, wildlife and us if it is connected, creating linkages between woodlands, allowing movement of animals, insects, seeds, pollen, etc. Plus it enhances all the other environmental functions that we've just talked about. So where could we plant these microforests, these Miyawaki style forests? So we've carried out a little exercise. We've, we've produced a, um, a green space map of Plymouth. So just to orientate yourselves, this is the Tamar running down this side, Plymouth Sound, the Plym, Saltram Park, Central Park, and the A38, the parkway running all the way through. I've just, can everyone see that? So I just had a message flash up that we had an unstable connection. I'm just making sure you can all see that, okay? Yeah, it's fine, Steve. Brilliant. Adam. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> okay. It's going really well, well today. Yeah. Um, so what we've done with this plan, we've, we've looked at all the existing green spaces we've got in Plymouth. That, that is the dark green, um, the dark green areas. We've then said, OK, well, if we're going to plant these microforests, where could we plant them? So just as a just for this presentation, we said, what about schools, colleges and university sites? And so we colored all those in, in light green. So. The key here, and we mentioned it earlier, is all about connectivity. It's linking our green spaces. You get much more benefit if you've got linkages. So this slide shows our existing linkages purely using um, the existing green space. So as you can see, you know, there is connection there, but there are a lot of truncated um, lines. There's a lot of truncated dashed lines. So connectivity isn't as good as it could be. However, if you start planting microforests, um, you can start linking the dots. And what you get is this web, web of um, green infrastructure, which crosses our city. It will tie into some of those areas where we've got lower uh, tree cover and start addressing the issues that we're trying to um, deal with through all the policy documents. So you can see that uh, this will ultimately mean that <clears throat> through the planting of microforests, we can enhance the city's green infrastructure network, increasing its effectiveness in providing the benefits of trees. Clearly, this is really conceptual. So it's a conceptual stage at the moment, and we understand that we won't be able to plant trees on all of those sites. However, you've also got to remember that we're only looking at schools, colleges, university sites. And there are plen there's plenty more land out there. For example, you've got MOD sites, housing association land, commercial land, land owned by hospital trust, or even privately owned land. So you can see that the opportunities are, are huge where we could actually plant these forests. And they're only very small areas of land that you need to do it on, eight by 10 meters, size of a 
size of a tennis court. So there is opportunity and that's something we really want to try and tap into. So that sort of concludes the first part of the presentation. So I'm now going to hand you over to Steve, who's going to take you through the next section of the, uh, of the presentation. Thank you, Adam. Good afternoon. Oh, who put that in? Uh, yeah, sorry, Steve. For those of you who don't know, Steve, um, he was given the nickname Tigger, so I couldn't resist putting that. Uh, Thank you very much. That slide in. I was about to say that I was going to, the, the professional bit had ended and here comes, it's going to be downhill from now on in, but clearly Adam's already set that tone. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I start, I wanted to have a bit of fun. I was uh, going to sort of challenge everybody in the room. I understand we've got about 80 people uh, attending, which is fantastic. Thank you all. Uh, so obviously there's a lot of really intelligent people in this room and Matt Parks. Now, I wanted to ask the question, how much do you all think it would cost to install a microforest? And what I'd like to do, because there are intelligent people and Matt Parks, I'm going to set a very basic specification. So to be fair to each and all, I'm going to give you this as a basic specification. Then I'd like you all to post your answers to, to Miles. And what we're going to do is at the end of the competition, we're going to announce the nearest guests and they will get themselves a free tree. So I just need to go through the, the specification. We're going to imagine that it is, this is an eight meter by 10 meter flat. It's, bat, it's grassland, that's all it is. So there's going to need to be an element of preparation. We're proposing, proposing to plant 400 trees. We will need 34 meters of protective fencing around these trees, which will of course need two gates. And for the, to ensure the correct um, uh, establishment of the forest, we would need to include two years of maintenance. So as I said, Miles, you know, I'll announce, if we can announce this at the end, that'd be great. And the nearest guest will announce, I'll announce the answer and then we will organize the uh, presentation of a, a tree. So moving on um, from that, how can we utilize just, the sorry, just, just to re, Just to make sure everyone, if you could um, just click the Q&A button and send your answers in that way, that'd be great. Thanks, Miles. I knew I'd get that wrong. But We're not soon. posting the... Hello. Uh, Maria's also asked what type of trees and how big are they? Oh, behave. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Come on, Tigger. <laughs> oh, all right. Mary, Ma Marie is far too clever. That was kind of, I, there was a subliminal clue in what I was doing there to throw you all off. But anyway, okay. So to be fair, there'll be an assortment of trees and they will be, Let's say they'll be up to a meter in height. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get too much more because you're just gonna spoil the fun. Anyway, can always, I move on? There's always one. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for that. Right, so, and I, someone's gonna now ask what type of fence. Um, 1. <laughs> 1. 1.5 meter high um, stock proof fence around it and two gates, timber gates, uh, etc. cetera. Um, how can we utilize the Miyawaki forest method? in Plymouth. Uh, you throw me completely now, Marie. Um, so I guess what I'm suggesting is that, what I'm asking is, we've, we've, Adam's pointed out the, the planting philosophy that we're gonna follow. How can we um, get leverage or how can we get this to be of interest or how can this attract everyone's attention and become something really quite viable? How can we move this from a concept? So how can we uh, take the Miyawaki forest uh, further? And we've had a bit of a play with this, and we're wondering whether we should go with something that's a bit of fun. Focusing on Adam's idea about this being part of uh, schools, uh, in, uh, uh, introduced to schools, then what I'm trying to do is through a subliminal sort of message is to empower and educate and encourage children to be engaged at an early age with all things trees, horticulture, landscaping, environment. My philosophy, the philosophy being that if we can empower them to have some fun and some interest to this, then they could all well be the people that go up, grow up and become influencers and, you know, have a benefit and, and actually contribute to the well-being of our planet. Even if they are the guys that there's more people out there planting trees, it's that simplistic. But if you can imagine that, you know, we've, we've, we've had a bit of a laugh doing this. Uh, Willie the Worm is, you know, and Sid the Snail and so on. You can imagine we've had some fun with this, but in essence, it's quite deliberate. It's to capture and to, to make some fun and make, give this some fun and, and hopefully broaden the attraction. 
So let's get the kids involved. Let's get the parents involved. Let's get the community involved. If we can imagine these forests, and I, we, we need to, these, these forests are not vast. They are these small areas that we're talking about. But if we can imagine that we can have um, outdoor teaching facilities within these forests where the kids can sit down and learn about things that are going on in their forest, where they could actually, and, and Nikki prompted me with this, um, you know, we could even have exercise, exercise trails within these forests. Um, let's imagine that the kids can, you know, get out there and get, you know, down and dirty with the bugs and bees. Um, we also, we've had some fun in the office to the point where we've had alternative designs for the presentation. Um, and actually we thought we'd include the two because clearly we are embracing as consultants, we're embracing the need for some, um, climate, the, the, the facts of climate change, because those of you, and this is probably you, Marie, will notice we've actually got a hummingbird in this particular wacky forest. Um, clearly, that's to, uh, a nod to climate change. Uh, it's not, it's the only bird with animation wings that we could get our hands to with our limited technology. Uh, Willie the worm down there, I believe, moves across the screen with the next uh, thing. Um, the idea of this as well is that we'd like to think this could actually evolve into even having some supportive literature, uh, IT, whatever. And so we, we end up with some caricatures that uh, um, live in my wacky forest. And again, that's just a subliminal way of introducing a bit of fun for the kids to learn more about biodiversity and so on. I guess really the next thing that we have to then think about, uh, if not the first thing, and, and this will become more relative, more relevant when you when you find out the answer to the question uh, at the end of this uh, today's presentation, is how are we going to pay for these forests? Well, you know we have given this consideration, and we've got four ideas straight off the cuff. So the first one, um, all of you will be familiar with these terms. We're looking at utilising um, funds that come from biodiversity net gain payments. So in other words, where uh, developments have to do offsite contributions, could one of these, could these contributions be put towards the Miyawaki Forest, the Green Web of Plymouth? I, I don't see a reason why they couldn't be. But as I say, this is conceptual. There are also other planning obligations um, that could be considered. And again, this could be cut, become part of the arsenal for um, authorities uh, to and, and architects and, and, and consultants to encourage more uh, planting and, and, and uh, green uh, uh, installation of green um, forests and etc. Sorry, getting tongue tied. Um, the next one is, is obviously uh, it's a hot topic, carbon offsetting. Um, we're looking at this uh, as a model to try and facilitate companies uh, offsetting some of their carbon footprint. David Bayliss only alluded this morning that Stride Triglown, um, I don't know if you're on the call, David, but forgive me for name checking you, but it's pertinent. He, he alluded to the fact that Stride Triglown have, you know, are very proud of the fact they've just, um, you know, they've done some work on this with their, their B Corps and their carbon offsetting and they're sponsoring a forest in Scotland. Now, I have no issues with that whatsoever, but, you know, we're suggesting we could be looking at this more locally. And this seems to tie in really pertinently with the agenda for Plymouth City Council with regards to the climate emergency that we're facing. So carbon offsetting, corporate sponsorship, that leads into corporate sponsorship of, for example, educational facilities, uh, facilitating educational uh, establishments in planting said forests. So let's get, for example, Stride to Clown to sponsor Egg Buckland School to plant a microforest in Liam School. Just a, an idea. But in other words, we're going to introduce and we're going to continue the theme of fun, community engagement. And as a corporate social responsibility, it's being covered by the entity themselves who are prepared to put their hands in the pocket and, and uh, you know, embrace that as an idea as part of their um, corporate strategy. Um, it, it doesn't also, it doesn't need to be purely money. I mean, it can be time. You know, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of companies have um, uh, social days where, where members of staff go out and, and do activities yeah. such as tree planting. There's no reason we couldn't no, bolt this onto that. Fundamentally, it's it's about this is 
the, the, the fun part of this is, is, is this is a marketing idea that we're just looking at giving some, giving this some traction to, to, to slightly, to, to raise the agenda about what we're all, and all of the like-minded people are on this call, what we're all here for, which is to, you know, help sort out our climate emergency. The final idea that we had, and one that has been recently, and, and, and I'd like to think has been relatively successful, is crowdfunding. Uh, I have the privilege of working with uh, Emma Hewitt from Building Plymouth. I'm sure you're on the call. Hi, Emma. Um, phenomenal effort by Emma. Um, great idea, which was born a couple of years ago, which was to establish uh, uh, re-landscape Marshmills Roundabout. The idea being to improve the gateway into the Plymouth City Centre. And fundamentally, crowd, or crowdfunding was a fundamental part of the success of this. It enabled us to attract funding to, to plant a thousand trees and 2000 square meters of wildflower seed. So, you know, I'm not saying that uh, Marshmills Roundabout is an example of a microforest, but I am saying that Marshmills Roundabout is testament to this, to, to what crowdfunding can do and the power of crowdfunding per se as a weapon or a consideration of ways to fund microforest planting. I guess really where I was coming to then really is, and I don't really need to ask this question, but it's kind of, I, I'm listening to Chris Woodfield a few weeks back, you know, he was posing a lot of questions, which certainly made me think about things that we're doing or not doing. And really it's about, you know, can we afford not to do this, more tree planting? Um, we all know that they're obviously of a natural beauty. They give endless environmental benefits, which Adam has alluded to, and indeed I'm sure Nikki will, in, uh, and, and indeed um, Ian and Tessa will as well. And of course, we've all identified or we all know, we're all hearing about, particularly in the pandemic, their benefits of walking through the woods and the forest. They have a proven mental and social well-being. So can we afford not to do this? And I, was, I suggest we all know the answer to that. But I really wanted to leave uh, or end with a sort of parting thought. Now, I loved this photo. Uh, it's it's uh, of an urban, for, an urban forest that's been established in a, in a house in Vienna. Uh, and the gentleman behind it, goodness me, I'm not going to be able to say this, was a guy called Friedrich Hundertwasser. Now, he is an Austrian artist, but he's also got an interest in architecture and he's got a passion and, and obviously an interest in nature. And as you can see from there, his idea was to allow nature to interject naturally with man and architecture. Now, I would suggest that's possibly gone a bit far. Um, and I do know there's been some problems with the building, but I thought it would be an interesting way to end. But what really was pertinent to me is the, the statement that he made in 1980, which was that peace negotiations with nature must begin sooner or later, or it will be too late. Now, to give that context, I would pose this thought. That was said in 1980. I would imagine that if I put that um, statement to you all and put underneath there Greta and she said it last week in Norway we would say that that would be believable that she said that so I'm just suggesting that is this not actually testament to the fact that we're not doing enough and we need to do more and that's why I'm sure we're all here we're all in mind you know we're all with the same thought that you know this is a phenomenal opportunity for us to make Plymouth a spearhead for some really innovative solutions to climate emergency. Um, you'll be relieved to hear that that's us done. Um, I did want to just remind you all, please put your answers in. We'd be really interested in, uh, in um, seeing your thoughts and comments. Obviously, Marie spoilt it, but I'll, uh, I'll uh, talk, take that up with her later at some other point. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for the opportunity to present and uh, over to you, Miles. Oh, thanks so much, guys. What a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, keep your keep your answers coming in. There's hell of a range. There's uh, there's lots of guesses coming in. Um, so yeah, press the Q and A button at the end. Um, thank you so much. I'm sure you also have lots of questions for Adam and Steve. So get them coming in as well, or, or raise your hand uh, if you'd like to ask a question for the end. That'd be great. Um, okay, now we're going to bring back Nicola. Uh, if we can get back, Nicola. I'm uh, back. We were, due, we were due a technical <laughs> pickup, I think. <laughs> Been too smooth for too long. Too long, we were due one. Uh, so I'm going to be your glamorous assistant. Uh, I'll do the slides for you. So if we get up the slides. Cool. I think if you just start at number nine, that's the couple of slides that people didn't catch. 
Yeah, sure. That's fine. There you go. So this is the um, easy to cross um, indicator. Just to remind you, these are the examples from Valencia in Spain, where I was just saying that the design of the street, super cheap, bit of paint. It's been made really clear through size and creativity that in this location, the priority is for the people trying to cross the street. Um, next slide, please. Yep. And this is the shade and shelter one, which I was talking about in um, in Valencia. Oh, sorry, in Chicago. Um, where it shows that Healthy Streets is not the result of one agency, it's a collective action. So there's architects that have designed buildings with fixed awnings, businesses have put up shades, um, and some street trees have been added. And there's a whole range of people working together to make this street um, a good place to walk and cycle and spend time, whatever, whatever the weather really. Um, next up is places to stop and rest. So these are particularly important to us when we're young or when we're old or injured or carrying heavy bags, which is probably surprisingly often. Um, I think sometimes when we're thinking about planning streets, we forget that sometimes people have different requirements um, and we assume that everybody is constantly moving. But the reality is that people don't really do that. Um, and places to stop and rest isn't just about benches. It's also about making sure we've got enough space for people when they're out walking and cycling to just move out of the flow of people, you know, to check your phone or to find out where you're going or to tie your shoelace and, you know, just things like that. Um, this example is from Montreal in Canada where um, some places to stop and rest were incorporated into the street environment um, completely separately to where movement happens. And uh, next up is not too noisy. Uh, so we've spoken a bit about this um, in terms of the health impacts of noise. Noise from road traffic makes streets really stressful. So reducing the noise from road traffic creates an environment in which people want to spend time and interact. This is an example from London um, where a large amount of street space was reallocated away from the movement of motorised vehicles for people to walk and cycle and spend time on that street. Um, and by doing that, the noise level on the street will have dropped significantly and and will mean that the people in the picture can read comfortably in their lunch break or have a conversation without having to shout. Next up is uh, choose to walk and cycle. The word the word of choice here is choose. Um, there are people who already walk and cycle and maybe that's their only choice. Um, what we want to do is to create places in which this is the best choice for the journeys that can be done on foot or by cycle. Um, and this incidental exercise is the best way to enable people to build that incremental physical activity throughout the day into their routine. Um, and people will choose to walk and cycle um, if these are the most attractive options for them. Um, this means making walking and cycling and public transport more or at least as convenient as, pub as private car use. So this is another example from London. Um, thinking about London as a collection of communities, not just a big city, where one lane of traffic was removed to create a cycle track, which is protected and buffered from the general traffic. It's not just a space for very confident, lycra clad cyclists. All people could choose to cycle here. And next up is people feel safe. Uh, feeling safe is a basic requirement that can be quite hard to deliver. But motorised road transport can make people feel unsafe on foot or bicycle, especially if drivers are travelling too fast or not giving them enough space, time or attention. People, of course, also need to feel safe from antisocial behaviour and unwanted attention, violence, intimidation and other things like street lighting, layout, passive surveillance and other people using the street can all help to contribute to that sense of safety. Um, these are two examples, one from Vienna in Austria and one from Auckland, New Zealand. They're both central city streets and I think they're interesting images as there are people walking and cycling in these streets and people can and are travelling on motorised transport too. I mean, I know shared space is a continually contentious subject, but I think it's about the quality of a well-designed environment and just knowing that streets have to be for people first. Next slide is things to see and do. Um, so we know that if we've got a visually engaging street at eye level, we're much more likely to walk and cycle and we're actually willing to walk and cycle longer, longer distances. It's like we need to provide a reason for people to use certain streets. So this is an example from Barcelona. It's an old town alley, but it piques interest as someone decided to hang bunting along it. People will then wander along it, wondering what makes it special. I might otherwise have not chosen to go down the street and might have chosen another. But look, there's pedestrians, cyclists, and even a skateboard. So there's a certain power of curiosity. Not, it's not all about active frontages and shops. Most streets don't actually even have shops on them. It's the surprising oddities that appear that make things interesting. Next thing is people feel relaxed. 
Um, and this captures the fact that there are a lot of elements to getting a street right from a human feeling perspective. Um, street environments can make us feel quite anxious if it's dirty or noisy, if it feels unsafe, or if we don't have enough space, or if we just can't easily get to where we want to go. And all of these factors are really important for making our streets welcoming and attractive to walk, cycle and spend time in. This is images of Van Gogh Walk in London. It's quite lovely. Um, and there are people clearly engrossed in conversation um, and their environment just isn't hindering them in any way. And I think this is the kind of environment that, if we, that we need to provide if we're genuinely going to create streets that work well for people. Next up is clean air. So this is an obvious one. Um, air quality has an impact on the health of every person, but it particularly impacts on some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in the community. Um, reducing air pollution benefits us all and helps us to reduce unfair health inequalities. This is a street in South Korea. Um, it's really green and leafy now. It used to be a very big highway with loads of traffic. Um, the air quality in Seoul is a challenge and now it's a natural environment where you can walk up to an hour along a riverside walkway with plants right through the middle of the city. It's a pretty extreme approach, but a pretty amazing initiative. And next up is everybody feels welcome. So streets must be welcoming places for everybody to walk, spend time and engage with other people. And this is necessary to keep us all healthy through physical activity and social interaction. This is what makes places vibrant and keeps communities strong. And the best test for whether we're getting our streets right is whether the whole community, um, particularly children, older people and disabled people, are enjoying using the space too. These are two examples, one from Boston, where a chap is taking a kid on a street cycle with stabilizers and feels absolutely comfortable doing so because of the way the street encourages this. And the other is from a Sport England campaign trying to get people to use the streets for social physical activity. Uh, next please. Um, so putting them all together, healthy streets is an approach more than anything as to how we use, plan and manage our transport system and public spaces. It's not a state of being and streets are not either healthy or unhealthy. Some perform better than others against the 10 indicators, but each street will have its strengths and its weaknesses and almost all streets could deliver more for people. Next please. So if we could go back to the five urban challenges, aside from the health issues, what else do you think might be involved or delivered through healthy streets? So we've got improving quality of life. People are really impatient and they don't want to just live well long term. They want to live well now and healthy streets can help deliver that better quality of life for people. Congestion, um, it's recognised that an alternative to building more roads could be to move people who are travelling by car onto cycles foot, cycle foot and public transport. Climate change. Well, in reality, this is the ultimate public health issue, really. Um, and a sustainable city in which people are travelling on foot and cycle and public transport will help some climate change issues. Failing high streets. This is a challenge in towns and cities all around the world. And we know that adapting and thinking about how we make our high streets engaging, welcoming places for communities um, to do a range of activities is really crucial. And finally, the cost of living. So the cost of living with increasing transport costs is an issue that lots of people are facing. Um, and if we can make it easy and attractive and safe and affordable to travel on foot or by bike or by public transport, we should absolutely be providing that option. And that's what Healthy Streets is about. It's just about thinking about how we can refocus motorised transport differently so we can give that space back to people and just see what they do with it. I think as the COVID-19 global pandemic sort of altered every aspect of urban life, many of the indicators that we've been talking about have been implemented to varying levels of permanence as a direct reaction. I think cities have pretty quickly implemented new street design and tools to help keep things like essential workers going and goods moving and provide safe access to food stores and other essential businesses, safe places for physical and social distancing while just getting outside. But um, yeah, and I think, yeah, I'm just going to show you a few more examples now where small changes have been implemented and are changing the focus of the street. Yep. So this is um, one of two specially designed parklets in Bath's Kingsmead Square. Uh, it's part of works to improve the evening economy and create a cleaner, greener public space. The parklets, which incorporate seating and planting, have been positioned in former car parking bays. I mean, I can imagine that there are many contexts in which local businesses would not be particularly enthused at the idea of having on-street parking removed. They might be concerned about their deliveries and customer habits and change. 
Um, but this could be a temporary project for a short period of time. It could be an attraction. And then that period of time could be extended and extended while everybody gets used to the fact that it's actually quite an asset to the street as has been found in other communities. Um, next up is this one, is this image. Um, I include this because it's about the business community in London. So the business improvement districts were amongst the earliest advocates for the healthy streets approach. They could see that this approach would help them to make their business areas more attractive for their workers and their visitors and their customers. And this particular crossing was funded out of a pot that was available to the improvement district to try out different innovative things to make their streets more people focused. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so this image is included as an example of a raised table crossing. So there are things like this that can be done that people probably won't even notice, um, but you will have made their life just a little bit easier. So what we've got is a footpath, but when it gets to the side road, the surface across the carriageway is at the footpath level and at the same or similar material. So for people walking, it helps them to feel relaxed. You can continue the flow of conversation as you cross a side road and people driving now understand that they're crossing over a place where pedestrians have the priority. Next slide. And this photo refers to 20 mile per hour limits. So healthy streets isn't all about street design or changing physical things on streets. It's also a little bit about um, high level policies. So bringing in lower speed limits is one of those things that compared with major engineering works could be considered relatively cheap, but it does really help to contribute to making streets more welcoming for people. Next, please. Uh, this is a street showing the kind of thing that will transform residential areas. So the middle, this is the middle of a residential street, which you used to be able to drive all the way through. So everybody could drive all the way through and they'd use it as a shortcut rather than sitting in traffic on a main street. So residential streets then get filled up with other people driving quite fast through them. So in these streets, an interruption's been imposed, people can still get to their door and park if they need to do so, but they just can't drive straight through anymore. And it makes this street a bit of a destination, so people will drive more courteously, more slowly, it brings children out into the street and start to use all that public space because it's a safer place to be. Next please. People feel welcome. Um, so this is an emerging development on Old Town New George Street in Plymouth. For those of you who are familiar with the location, you can see how the design of the street now feels a lot more of a welcoming place rather than a place for moving traffic through. Some traffic will still need to be accommodated, um, but now it's a place for people, not a place to drive to eat McDonald's. So if we can think about the streets in the way they feel, not as a system for moving objects around. Next, please. This is a business local to Plymouth. It's a much cleaner and less traffic dominated system than a motor vehicle and often quicker. It's important to remember that a lot of the things that we assume need to be done by car don't, and they can be done by other means. So it's a good example of healthy streets also, not just being something for the local council and local businesses to think about, but also about entrepreneurs and individuals saying, do you know what, we're just gonna do something different here. Next, please. And on that note, this is a resident that felt it was not reasonable that the curbside space on her street could be rented out for parking cars, but not for any other use. So she took matters into her own hands and asked if she could have a parking permit to create a space um, for which she would use to do something different. Her request was refused and she decided to do it anyway. She, cre she created this local place to stop and rest, shade and shelter, things to see and do, ticks all those healthy streets boxes, um, piques people's interest, something odd and curious. Um, and she's been through a long process of arguing the case for why this curbside space could and should be used differently. And the local authority has changed its policy and it's allowing residents across the borough to buy permits to use the space in this kind of way. And next up, we have how healthy streets might fit into a wider streetscape. So this is in Plymouth, it's a Union Street party. This event makes a massive difference in the community in terms of things to see and do. And it's not just about um, the long-term permanent changes. Sometimes healthy streets is literally about getting people out, getting people together and having reasons for us all to be together in public spaces. Next please. So let's move on to communicating the benefits and how we can measure and quantify things. So it's start with money, that's obviously got to be a consideration. Uh, cities around the world are monetizing the benefits of considering our health in terms of design and activity and our access to green spaces. And in this country, 
so far a London specific manual on how to communicate those um, financial benefits and a brochure of example of projects that have been delivered has been produced and templates have been formulated. And they deliver figures like this, which I think I think are quite interesting to read. And we also have a system for checking the health of a street. And this approach is seen as having such a benefit um, for London that Transport for London requested that in all their transport projects, a healthy streets check for designers must be produced, which they've commissioned. So despite this approach and check holding no formal policy status, um, it does advise designers and decision makers on how a street benefits and is being used. So this is a little bit of an example. Oh no, back one, sorry. A um, bit of an example as to what some of those metrics look like in helping to determine the health of a street. The current set of metrics are very London focused, um, of course they are, but it's a series of questions where you objectively score a metric which is weighted against the indicators. It's also recognised that London and the rest of the country are not the same, um, and therefore there's a, a national steering group that I'm on with Healthy Streets who are re-evaluating the checklist for things that are relevant outside of London, and we're accounting for the villages and small towns that make this country up. Next please. And finally, this is what the output from the Healthy Streets Check for Designers looks like. This tool can be used on the designs of all new projects so that we can show people what we're planning on doing will deliver a benefit in terms of how it feels to be on that street. So the black line in the centre um, shows the before and the green line um, after alongside each incremental improvement. And this is an example from measuring our capital project, our town New George Street Public Realm Scheme in Plymouth that I showed you earlier. Um, we did this retrospectively on the design, but through this process, we can show that when we put projects into the public domain, what we're expecting the difference to be, um, we can show that to the public and the public can tell us if they think we're doing enough. Next, please. But we can also use this tool to inform design options and opportunities. So as another example, I've also recently measured Royal Parade in Plymouth by the London metrics. And on the face of it, you might think, great, it surely must score really well. It's got really nice wide footpaths. It's got some bus shelters, great public transport hubs, leafy green trees and lots of planting. But what it has shown is that as a pedestrian, that street's quite one sided. And to access the facilities on the other side of the road, there are quite a lot of barriers and it's quite a walk to find a break in those barriers. And public transport terms, it sort of feels like everything's, sorry, back one, <laughs> feels like you're tripping over each other. And as a cyclist, you really do take your life into your own hands on that street with buses pulling in and out, general traffic, motoring along, large lorries and vans, random chicanes and obstacles. And I really do understand how this sort of builds up incrementally as thoughts and processes change across time. But I can't imagine it's pleasant for anyone to traverse, let alone an amateur cyclist. And like I say, this can be used to deform, to inform the design process and options. It's just to point out really that streets aren't perfect, even on the face of it. Um, it's not a blame game and most streets in this country won't score well, but it's about taking the opportunity to do better when we can. Uh, last slide, please. So to this end, Plymouth City Council has seen the Healthy Streets approach as a tool to aid Plymouth in our climate emergency commitments. So we've committed to adopting the Healthy Streets check as a KPI across infrastructure projects to create streets where people are encouraged to walk or cycle for appropriate trips. I think pre-COVID, it's been proven that we know that there's a need for something to be done to square up our public health and transportation focus. We know there's a benefit to a well-being led approach and I think with this healthy street system we know we can measure it and we can communicate it and it's entirely achievable. I think post-COVID in an unprecedented year so many things have been proven that inform our well-being and subsequent links to physical activity and we've used and valued our space and streets and public realm more diversely than ever before particularly I think in that first lockdown last year and we really needed to capitalize on that enthusiasm more so than the enthusiasm for which motorized transport has been passionately re-embraced recently. I think we're making really good headway in our reactions from converting curbside lanes into expanded footpaths or bike lanes to creating pedestrian only or slow streets um, to enable physical and social distancing to designating footpath or street space for safe seating, so cafe seating or outdoor dining um, and all those kind of things. And I think that this resource really provides some technical assistance and real world examples and information on planning, public engagement, um, implementation and monitoring for each of these strategies. 
I think um, I think the need for real collaboration across the city, counties and national boundaries has never been so urgent and we need to make it easier for cities everywhere to respond faster, innovate better and really support their residents in more equitable and sustainable ways. So this has just been a bit of an introduction to Healthy Streets, um, where it's come from, how Plymouth's intending to use it to help us. There's loads of information on the internet to expand these ideas um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions where I can or find out things further for anybody interested. Um, thank you to my lovely assistant. Thanks, Nicola. And uh, thanks so much for a really fantastic presentation. Um, really interesting stuff. I'd love to see one of those funky crossings in Plymouth somewhere. <laughs> They're really cool. Uh, I'm sure you have some questions for Nicola, so please send them in for, for the chat for our Q&A at the end. Uh, so finally, uh, we have Tess Wilmot and Ian Smith from Food Plymouth. Uh, who are going to explain some theories and local actions in uh, permaculture and urban farming. So over to you both. Okay, can you... Oh, can you see us, hear us? Yes, yeah. it's all good. Good, Great. okay. <laughs> okay. And are we going to inter, go into screen share if that's okay? Yeah. Great. Um, which one is it? Um, can't see which one it is. Oh, we're just trying to find it. It, it worked fine before. I'm going to go and tech, find it. Tech issues. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, great to see you all. And um, so. Um, we're just going to run this through from the perspective of Food Plymouth as the local sustainable food partnership um, with an accent on the permaculture side of things. So uh, um, uh, over to you, Tess. Uh, can you first, can you see the slide? Has that worked? Yes, that's all good, Tess. Yes. Great. Great. Good. Okay, <laughs> Thank you very much. Helps. That's really helpful. Okay. Okay. So where are we going? Go that way. Okay, do you want to do the first bit? Please? I will. So, so we are the city's recognised local food partnership. We were established in uh, 2010, uh, and we are that central hub for food-related matters in the city. It's great uh, to be along talking to you about this. Um, a key thing of our work is that we do work to a collective impact model, and we work to the six strands of the sustainable food places movement that we belong to. Um, uh, which really equate to the three domains of uh, sustainable development. So it's social, economic, uh, environmental. Um, so hopefully you'll hear a fair bit of that uh, in this. Okay, so the slide coming up is just showing some of the things that were happening, a bit of a timeline to show where we, how we've got to where we are now. And in 2008, it started with Dig for Devonport and uh, transition town started after that and always apples and these are individual things that were happening with groups of people um, and it's really interesting to see what was happening then and how things developed over time and sort of food Plymouth came in with the influences of Big Devonport, always apples and the transition movement and forage Plymouth um, came a little while later and permaculture Plymouth and then uh, 2019, we had some funding to do some really interesting projects, um, the Community Explorers and the Growing Community Abundance. And then more recently this year, um, well, since, um, since COVID, since last year, we've been working on some projects um, which include Generous Earth around composting, community composting, um, and then Jar Squad and the Sustenance Project. So this gives you a little sort of glimpse of some of the things I was just trying to show what Food Plymouth is doing and how, um, um, how they relate to each other. So the things closer to the circle are the Food Plymouth project and then the other things are feeding in and interlinking and it's all um, a way of linking together and creating beneficial connections. And so that's what really has been happening over these um, 
few years. And one of the things somebody said about jar squad, it was one of the missing ingredients. Um, and so we're looking for missing ingredients and trying to find beneficial connections. Um, and it's been really, really exciting and lots of things, lots of learning and lots of um, uh, enjoyable things going on, on by doing this interactive um, learning. Yeah, and that's the permaculture principle of integrate rather than segregate, isn't it? Which very much ties in with the, the Food Plymouth Collective Impact approach. Well, yeah. um, so, so moving on, um, a lot of work in the and uh, professionals and stakeholders uh, and engaging and then trying to influence, I guess, rather than just influencing. Um, so very interested in the work that Adam and Steve were explaining there, because that rhymes very much with what we do. Uh, but we engaged uh, with the future of food in Plymouth uh, with this uh, document that informed the Plymouth plan that went on to become part of the uh, joint local plan. Um, and we always join in with planning uh, events if, if we're able to, and planning on the edge, the international event in Plymouth 2019. Had some brilliant food uh, conversation there, which was great. Um, so over to Tess for the permaculture. <laughs> okay, so I've been involved with permaculture for a long time now. Um, I did my original course in 95, 96, and I did my diploma in 2003. And then I got involved with community um, permaculture when I started Big for Davenport in 2008. Um, and basically it's an amazing, array of tools and things you can use to help you design and um, you know when you're talking about the forest and the, the trees you're saying you know design is really really fundamental and I totally agree with that um, and the permaculture design tools uh, some of them come from business some of them come from design like in architecture and, but we've adapted and, and created a lot more and basically a lot of what we do is working with nature and learning from nature instead of battling against it. Mm -hmm. um, and here's one example of one of the principles, um, because we ha have principles which help us um, to, um, to, to help guide us through the, and, and almost like a lens that you look through, um, that you look at things from different directions so you don't get stuck in that rut. And this is the one um, obtaining a yield. Uh, you can't work on an empty stomach. Um, and I'll just read this out quickly because I think it's really, really important. Make sure that every time you design a house, a garden, park or school, it includes elements that will provide real tangible yields. The yields could be wood, could be food, fiber or fuel, but there needs to be something. It is crazy to live in settlements where the only food source is a shop. And to get there, to get to the shop, you pass gardens and parks filled up with ornamental plants and gravel. And there are places in Plymouth which are, you know, food deserts. So it's really important to see what we can do in those areas. Uh, here's another slide coming up. About uh, permaculture, showing it's not just about growing, not just about plants, but actually it's very holistic and it includes a lot of different um, elements. Um, so it's much more than most people think. There's one saying about permaculture: it's um, um, it's revolution um, dressed up as gardening. So it's <laughs> it's far more than just doing a bit of gardening and <laughs> planting things. And it's good to see the ethics and design <laughs> principles, and there are the permaculture principles, aren't they, which uh, yeah. run through everything. And I think that's so important. Yeah. yeah. So I think I was going to speak to this one. So this is about marginality, really, edges. Ed edges is so important. I think Nikki and Adam and Steve have brought that out really well in what they've explained, showing the value of where, where systems come together, how you could, what a rich and productive place that can be with a bit of imagination and a bit of will and everything that goes with that. So uh, I think this is the really interesting uh, thing about spatial design, architecture and spatial planning. Um, and there's also the marginal though, around uh, the, the other wider margins in society uh, and people and, and activities on the edge of society that maybe ought to become more mainstream. 
Um, and this is true. I think permaculture itself has been marginal for many years, but has become more and more mainstream as the transition movement in particular has taken off. Um, so I, I just feel that, that liminality, that marginality is something that we need to explore and work with rather than ignore and run away from. I think that's come out really strongly. It's been a theme throughout this. So Okay, um, just wanted to show, because architecture is very strong in uh, a lot of the work that's been shown in, on the previous um, webinars, um, just that we do have some amazing examples like Brook Green Centre of Learning in Plymouth, and that was actually made by Gail and Snowden, who are based in North Devon, and they, their whole architecture business is infiltrated as it were <laughs> with another culture and you know they train all the people all the people who work there actually do the permaculture course and so it's really infused the whole thing and the designs they do are amazing and one of the things i would love to do is actually you know see all the amazing architecture around the city uh, including this yeah that's true um and um, what Transition Town Totnes and the transition movement are very good at showcasing the incredible um, array of creative solutions and they very, very often keep me, um, keep me feeling strong because I know they're out there breaking new ground, creating new spaces, um, new designs, new opportunities and the transition movement has been key to, um, to a lot of the, what's been happening uh, in Plymouth and and in England, um, and if you can get a chance to um, get Rob Hopkins to come to one of these webinars, he would be amazing. Yes. I think again, though, it's the imagination; it's unleashing the power of imagination to create yeah. the future we want. And I think that's what this series is all about. My understanding of it, so uh, I think that's where we need to be going. Um, and the amazing opportunities, like you've been speaking. Yeah, yeah. When I started. Um, doing uh, growing and community growing in 2008 you couldn't plant a fruit tree on council land or housing association land so it's changed a lot now there is um, so many gardens and gardens. it's incredible so we've had a lot of change so I'm really enthused about how much change we can have in the next 10 years up to um, 2030 um, and it's a we're building a lot of activists as well by doing permaculture courses and doing the transition stuff and doing the food Plymouth. And so we've got a real resource of amazing people with growing skills and creative skills, design skills. And COVID has also opened us up to make, um, make all this more um, accessible, easier to, to spread. Mm -hmm. And it's just behind the little cafe there, and they produce an amazing amount of food um, every year. Yeah, that's so uh, that's tremendous. I'm just going to quickly whiz through to work on urban growing. So, this is the Beeman project in North Prospect in 14, uh, where it went from that to this in a very short space of time with, uh, with uh, input from Tess and others to create that back to our community home, the Housing Association, which was tremendous. And uh, we had Elliot Kett from the RSA Food Farming and Country. We're having it all today. I think we've, we've lost uh, Ian and Tess for a minute. Hopefully we'll get them back um, for the last few slides. Whilst we're waiting for them to come back, I'll just remind you of, oh, they're coming back now? Are you there, guys? We lost you. Are you back? Okay, can you yes. hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, yeah, we can hear you now, yes. Oh, great. Okay, let's, let's keep flashing through then. Uh, so, yeah. Ah, 
doing the same thing at um oh here we are um okay so let's go to the next slide and this is um we i was talking about the activists we've actually had to grow the growers and it's been really important part of our design is to grow the growers and get more people with the skills to support the over 40 community gardens and the over 40 community orchards. We've got so many in the city. Yeah, one of which is Paul Farm, of course, which is the city farm, which the city council is backing. Uh, yeah. And one of the community um, orchards there at Efford Valley and the Always Apples on tour, um, which is great. And I think one of the interesting things here is that the work that the city council is doing with the green estate management solutions gems um, and this is really making the most of the parks and green spaces in the city uh, which um, which uh, Tess and others have been deeply involved in um, so that's well worth looking at and there's a lot of potential in there for urban food growing um, you know I, I wouldn't quite call it farming but it's certainly there's a lot of scope for um, for urban growing and there's a lot of great work on this as a resource from uh, the social farms and gardens used to be known as the Federation of uh, of uh, um, city farms and uh, community gardens, um, and they work a lot with Sustain, which is the Alliance uh, for Food Farming and Fishing. And this is an event in London I went to on urban growing and uh, Sustain's capital growth uh, work in London with urban growing there, which was tremendous. Okay, and. Um one of the challenges in um, in agriculture and also in the cities is the soils. And so we've, we've actually been doing some work on that. And we created a project in Food Plymouth called Generous Earth, um, where around community composting and building the soil and building the knowledge of how to deal with what is sort of as waste and um, use it as a resource in, instead. Uh, and that's been a really exciting development recently. Here is some pictures just to show you sort of before and after how um, communities can be transformed and communities can actually, like at the Beacon, the residents can get involved and actually help um, transform their areas. And first of all, often it's uh, trying to get the wildlife in first, but also um, eventually sort of looking at how, how to grow more and more food. So this is down in Devonport, um, and it's been a really interesting project. Yeah, it's getting pollinators in and then um, putting in edibles as well, like rooting edges. That. Yeah, and herb gardens. Mm. Um, one thing I love about permaculture is it um, it shows all the crazy and interesting and unusual ideas. And here's just some um, interesting ones. Um, incredible edible up in Todd Morden set up um, um, growing everywhere in their <laughs> town and that's spread across um, England there's a lot of that sort of thing happening and the bottom picture the bottom right hand side is actually the outside the police station and the, the police actually help yeah. and you've got the Genesis building with the um, green walls and I know you had a really good presentation on green walls the vertical and using roof space would be amazing yeah, so that's great. And here's some, some really nice ideas. This is from a convalescent in Mid Wales, um, borrowing that idea for um, a, a table in uh, Devonport in Plymouth, which is done well. And I guess looking to the future. Okay, so yeah, so looking for the future, it's some of the ideas I think we need to involve um, you know, doing the soil, obviously, but also water storage and this spring has been really shown how much we need it it's been so dry I think the last my brother said who's a farmer so the last time we had good rain was about the sort of 10th of March or something ridiculous you know, we need water storage and we need rainwater harvesting and designing buildings and spaces so people can grow food and a bit like um you know the first presentation yeah um yeah. Just reconnecting with everything. Yeah, I think it's the bioregional approach and the hinterland. It's the city region approach rather than just the city. Uh, and this is connection with uh, the outlying areas outside of Plymouth, where um, it's 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 linking in and, and people going back onto the land, um, as used to happen, as is illustrated here. 
Um, and here's an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, next Monday, if you want to join us for another um, online thing, we'll actually be saying a lot about what we've been doing with the sustenance project um, with our research. So please do join us. And also there's a, um, you can go to on the website and there's some really interesting, um, uh, what do you call it, surveys? Surveys to do, <laughs> yeah, about local food. So if you're interested in that, would like to take part. We'd please love do. to hear from you. And I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, there was there was also a a little um, multi question, um, multi choice question that might be uh, fun to share out. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether Miles is there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. But thank you for listening. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's our multi choice question. So. Um, this is multiple choice. You can pick as many of these as you like. So this week, have you planted any seeds, eaten any foods you've grown, supplied, given away, swapped or any food that you made or grown, ordered or received a veg box, chosen, chosen food specifically because it does not have any plastic wrapping, forage food or composted any of your food waste? So there's um, answers coming in now. So this is coming in. Quite a lot of people have chosen food specifically because it does not have any plastic wrapping. So that's quite a lot. Um, whilst everyone's getting their answers in, thank you so much, Ian and Tess, for that really great presentation. Um, please again get your questions in for our Q and A session next, um, and we've got quite a lot to go through as well. And also, if you've if you've forgotten to put your answer in for Adam and Steve's quiz. Um, now is the time. So I'm going to end the poll there. So the results are, um, yes, so mainly quite a lot of people have chosen food specifically to not be plastic wrapping. Um, composting is quite popular and uh, planted, planted seeds, that's great. That's great. Everyone's doing a little bit, so that's cool. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, just before we get into the q and I just want to thank you, a thank to all our sponsors and, and partners. Uh, please check out our website, futureplymouth2030.co.uk, to see them all there. Thank you so much for your support. If you would like to become a sponsor or a partner, please get in touch at hello at futureplymouth2030.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, for our next webinar, uh, please join us uh, on May the 5th. Uh, our next topic is health and well-being. Uh, we have three guests with us, uh, um, well, four actually, uh, Tan Dagro and Catherine Adar from Hall Leaf Partnership will introduce uh, wellbeing principles and methodologies to, uh, for assessing these in context for the built environment. Uh, we also have Roger Higman from the Network of Wellbeing, who will discuss the healthy building, uh, healthy building environments, which will equal then healthy people and planet. And then finally, we'll have Mike Wesley from the University of Plymouth, who would explain why the green and blue infrastructure of external spaces uh, are also a big importance to well-being from a design perspective. So um, after this webinar, go and book your place um, on our website and we'll see you then. So um, Steve and Adam, do you want to, should, should we leave it, should we leave them in suspense or do, do you want to give, uh, have you chosen a winner? Do you want to announce uh, the answer to the question? Hi Miles, um, well, up to you if you want to give people another 10 minutes to answer. We've only had, I think we've had about 20 answers so far. We have uh, some interesting answers. Uh, up to you. I don't mind if other, there's other people that have missed it. Just to reiterate what we're doing. Do you, do you want to remind? Do you want to remind people of the question? Yeah. So the question was, um, how much do you think it would cost to plant a micro forest? The specific, the basic specification was based on planting 400 trees that would be up to a meter in height of assorted types. Uh, within a, a, an area eight meters by 10 meters that was flat and is current grassland. Uh, we would need a fence around this area to be 1.5 meters high, um, stock proof fencing, with two gates, and we would need to include for two years of maintenance. 
So just for a bit of fun, how much would that, do people think that would cost to implement uh, this microforest? And shall we say 10 more minutes? 10 more minutes, leaving them in suspense. Let's um, yeah, get your answers in for that question. Thanks, Steve. So I'm gonna bring everybody back um, on, on video uh, for our Q&A session. And I'm going to come to Matt first because he's got his <laughs> hand up. I love people who do that. Matt, what's your question for the panel? Well, I, I was asked to put questions together. Um, <laughs> firstly, um, thank Steve for pointing out my lack of intelligence compared to everybody else on the call. Uh, I'm, I'm still doing my bedtime reading, Steve. I will get there. Um, so... Answer, I have a question for each of you, actually, but answering your question about the forest, I think, how much will it cost? I think the answer is nil if you get Emma Hewitt on the case because she'll go and get the funds for you. Um, Clearly, you're the winner, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, the, uh, I was quite interested, the microforests, um, and it just occurred to me in terms of how can we pay for these things. Just looking at how could it be interesting to know how the council feel about tapping into the sill um, to finance some of these microforests. And I thought your map was really interesting. I'm just putting this out as a discussion piece, really. You've got your map that showed the current routes and the aspiration to reconnect. And it would be interesting how that could connect with the uh, permaculture um, mm. map the Plymouth Community Gardens and Orchards project, how could those come together and could we be approaching the council looking at SIL funding? Because if you look at the definition of SIL on the government website, it would be covered by the SIL. Um, but also encouraging corporate sponsorship where you get match funding. So if the council agreed to release a certain percentage of the SIL towards a forest, a, you know, green forest, urban forest, community garden project, a similar, that amount would then be match funded by the developer. Um, that was just, mm. so it'd be interesting how you could move the business forward in that regard. My question to Nikki was really going to be um, the, the health check for des, uh, designers scoring system. I was going to ask you, our PCC looking at adopting that, but then your last slide showed <laughs> that, that, that that is the case. So that question yeah, is it's, it's quite good. It's quite good too, Matt, because we're um because I'm on that steering group for driving the um the um health check for the rest of the country. It's been really good to be able to test those on our streets as well. Um, and are there and other like cities test, doing the same testing? Yeah, it? absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So our our smaller steering group is from Plymouth, Essex, um, Norfolk, like all over, all over the country. And we're all testing the metrics, the new metrics, which are a much more concise and probably more relevant kind of set of questions in our smaller, smaller centres. Okay, well, interesting. So is that now adopted as policy here or is something that will be adopted? Um, it's in our climate emergency action plan. So it's, a t it's an action under our under our climate emergency action plan that all of the all of the um infrastructure pro projects that we undertake will have this check applied to them so that we can sort of monitor and measure how how okay. what, what the improvements are and how we're doing that okay and again it would be interesting how that could marry in with the the, the sort of the, the the philosophy behind permaculture because I've, I've always found tests with permaculture that it's 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 not as well, people don't know about it that, that much. It's not out there, you know, as architects, we're designing, we'll either be designing to Briam um, or now there's Letty, you know, the architect's focus right now is fabric first approach. And we're almost in danger of losing um, the focus of the, the white, the connection with the wider urban setting and community and the permaculture um, methods uh, and principles could well, um, have an important part to play there. So my question was, do the Permaculture Association um, have a CPD programme? Because I think there's a lot of RIBA members and members of other professional institutions that could really benefit from permaculture lunchtime CPD. I think there's an opportunity there. I, th I think there's oh, a yeah. huge opportunity. Um, uh, thank you, Matt, for that. Um, they're very open to 
finding opportunities and uh, I, I'm sure that um, Andrew Goldring and the other people at um, uh, the association office up in Leeds would be really interested to talk about that actually. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put that to Andy. Yeah. yeah. I'll have um, a chat with Andy. Yeah. I was his, mm. uh, he and I were at school together. I know. Really? Good. Good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and it might be worth also speaking to um, um, at the um, Gail and Snowden, and I forgot his first name, um, Gail. Is it? I forgot his first name. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But he, um, you know, he did his presentation of um, his permaculture uh, diploma, which I went to, was, was amazing. So that's, a, I think, another really good link to speak to him. Because I think, I think a lot of architects, sorry, I think a lot of architects would be really interested. At the moment, we have Passive House. Um, various other fabric first initiatives, BRIAM, etc. But very few architects actually know of the permaculture principles and the training courses that are there. Um, and just a, a one hour, it's a good marketing piece for the Permaculture Association <laughs> to have, do a one hour um, CPD because I think a lot of architects would be very interested and engineers, urban planners, etc. So that, that well, was. Yeah, let's pursue that. I, what I would like to just quickly throw in on that, Matt, as well, and, and everyone, is that um, we're doing a lot of work with Food Plymouth with the Devon Donut, the Donut Economics, with a sort of social floor and a planetary environmental ceiling and working well in that space. Um, and Andy Goldring came and took part mm -hmm. in that recently. Um, so, so Devon Donut might be a thing that might be of interest you know, to others on the call here. And um, uh, that's being led by Jane Brady and Isabel Carlyle out of the Bioregional Learning Centre. Um, so um, please make contact with me afterwards. I'll send you some contact details for that if that's of interest. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Could I okay. just add uh, or, or ref reply to you, Matt? Um, firstly, I want to say that, you know, actually, as is always the case, Matt, I know you do contribute um, to all these meetings but what's in, what's really impressive is how much you've learned and how much more intelligent you've become in the last hour and a half anyway uh, just, just well, that, that, that was thanks to adam's presentation steve <laughs> <laughs> thanks, um, so, joking aside um <laughs> joking aside matt I, I i um i picked up on the it was ian and tessa's uh, the map of uh, all the areas where there are all the gardens in Plymouth. And I said, and it, it occurred to me that actually we should be talking because mm. we're absolutely right. This green web, that the idea behind our microforests does not need to stop at microforests. It's about connectivity of wildlife and so on. And there seems to me to be a, a real synergy of an opportunity there. So thank you yeah, for pointing that sure. out, Matt. Um, but everyone else in the room knows that was our idea, not yours. <laughs> 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 and, and the other thing which I think is really relevant is um, in permaculture, I didn't mention it, but there's uh, for it, what we call forest gardening. So that's another way of uh, yeah. not quite the same as what you're talking about, but very uh, has similar, you know, really interesting sort of aspects. Um, and, you know, I think all these things, it's again, it's, like you said, it's creating, creating a tapestry, a, a diverse, diverse landscape is what's really important in the city. And mm. it, will, it will make a world of difference um, if we yeah. can do that. Mm. For sure. Yeah. Okay. That Miles, Thanks, I will say no more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> So uh, going to everyone else's questions as well. So uh, thank you to Alan. Um, probably a question for um, Stephen, Alan and Nicola. Um, how could the local authority persuade residents in roads and streets to plant a uh, suitably sized tree in front of their garden where possible, creating avenues? Which species of trees are recommended for the average front garden? Should we take that? Um, Go for it, yeah. They... I'll answer the horticultural bit because I'm not sure how I'm not sure what to say about how we persuade the council. Um, I'm, I don't know whether it's necessarily a case of persuasion. I think they're very open to, and certainly when we've engaged with them on numerous conversations about this whole green agenda, I think they're open to any innovative ways of doing and achieving and helping climate emergency. Um, so I think it's an educational thing there. That's all it is. Trees for a front garden um numerous suggestions and when we say the average size garden then i'd need to refer back to marie and say well what's average what size how high is the bit i'm joking um 
you know, so obviously you've got Birch, you've got certain members of the Sorbus family, uh, so the Mountain Ash family, uh, you could consider Malus. So those, all, none of those mm. are you know, typically mm. large growing trees. You could also consider the management of the tree in the context of sort of uh, how you manage the root system. So if, you're, if, you, if you are uh, close to services or your driveway, or to the, you know, then you can use things like root barriers and so on. And by doing that, what you're doing is you're um, constraining, if you like, the, the growth of the tree. So it's not going to achieve its natural size. And I know that that isn't necessarily natural, but, but it's, a, it's it, you know, I'd rather have 10 of those trees in the street than none at all. So, you know, there are other trees you could consider. And, and then I would move on to things that something like um, the Asa Capestri Streetwise, there's the Sorbus, um, what's the narrow column the one i'll think of it in a minute always great to not remember the name of something um so what happens when you get to 55 my favorite amelanchia <laughs> amelanchia pyrus beautiful pyrus chanticleer great example to those at mount wise which guess what folks was designed by acom back in 2006 which is where adam used to work and implemented by yjs landscapes um beautiful examples pyrus chanticleer that's a really columnar autumn color, good flowering, uh, beautiful plants. Hopefully, I mean, by all means, we can put this, type this or send it to someone if they need any further information. <laughs> I mean, the other thing about street trees, uh, and it's interesting you say, okay, we've got a, a, a street and we want to put an avenue of, of trees in it. In urban environments, I very much feel that, you know, we, we should treat trees as a crop, you know, sometimes we have to put them in really constrained spaces and my view is it's much better to have something in there that doesn't reach its full potential and replace it every 15 20 years as opposed to having nothing you know and whether we can do that in an, an above ground container that's a, a little bit smaller than you would say a, a, a standard tree pit um you know so there are ways of doing that and i, I, and I think it's all about all you need is one person to have a good idea and they can bring others along with them. And we've had great success with crowdfunding and it just, just shows at the, um, on the Mayflower Forest at Marsh Mills how passionate people are about trees. Yeah. Um, and we had huge support there because people wanted trees planted. So there is a massive desire out there and it's just tapping into it. And I think the, the council are also behind this. So it's, um, it's coming up with a good idea. Yeah, if, if I could just say something as well, if there isn't space for a tree, the other thing would be really beneficial for um, the streets um, is to do climbers and to find um, uh, ways of doing different ways of growing. I remember going down the streets in Stoke and all the little birds were in the climbers. I think it was a honeysuckle or um, uh, something like that. But there's, it's also creating habitats. There's very, you know, um, the birds and other creatures and the bees. So not necessarily having streets, uh, having trees, but there are other ways that you can creatively grow something to create that greenery, the flowers, the pollination, the seeds, the, you know, all, all the different elements mm. that um, create abundance. Yeah. I mean, fruit bushes, yeah. you did a lot of that with the early days of Big Ben yeah. with blueberries and red currants yeah. and, and so on. The other thing I would say, I, I take the point about the trees not reaching their full potential, but I'd seriously encourage thinking about using fruit trees on dwarfing, on semi dwarfing rootstocks, yeah. um, you know, and that they get the benefit of everything then flowers, the fruits, and everything in between. Yeah. And the crab apples, you mentioned the malus, which is the Latin for. Um, uh, you know, the apples, uh, crab apples in, in particular, are very good in smaller spaces and you know, very abundant. Yeah. Right, that's enough on the always apples, but there we are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have a question from Helen, actually. Uh, so uh, just a question to probably all of you. How, how do you suggest a balance is formed between the benefits of healthy streets and people's concerns about access to local businesses, particularly in smaller towns where the population is more dispersed and the community is reliant on the car. I can start that one off if you like. So I Good. think <laughs> I think um like, like you said it is about balance and it is about appropriate appropriate journeys. Some journeys it is appropriate to take 
by car, right? But what we're trying to do is to encourage people to take the journeys that they can by foot or by cycle and to choose to do that or by public transport. And, you know, maybe some work needs to be done on what, um, you know, an effective public transport routes and what would what would make people want to choose that over getting in their car and driving. I think um I think it's particularly in like in rural and um rural areas, um it's also a little bit about what would make you okay, so you've you've got in your car and you've driven to one shop in, in town or you know whatever village you might live in. Do you then walk to the next to the next destination or do you get in your car and drive drive to the next destination because there are certainly communities that do that do where people do do that and that's their choice of transport because they don't feel safe they don't like it it's just not an enjoyable environment and you know that even that little bit of incremental exercise incidental incremental exercise it all it all helps um and so i think it just is a little bit about thinking about what what is it that might make you choose to take that journey by foot or by cycle I think you're spot on, Nikki, and I think that human beings, we're very habitual, aren't we? we if we're used to doing it, we mm -hmm. can't see that there's any other way, but there are hundreds of different ways yeah. of doing things, and we just need to think outside the box occasionally, and that means, do we have to get in the car, or can I take the bike, can I walk, or can I car share? That's better than yeah. two people going in. So yeah, there, there's loads of options, but we just need to break habits. Yeah. Um, I, I would just like to say I've just um, been having some fun learning to ride a cargo bike, an electric cargo mm -hmm. bike um, for uh, Generous Earth and then for next week for the sustenance um, uh, we're doing a seed bank tour where we're riding around the city and um, visiting different parks and things and going to where that um, uh, Freedom Park where that uh, nice picture of the lush lettuces were um, and so I've been um, I've, I'm being converted into a, a great fan of the electric bike, and it really does um, get rid of the hills. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to speak to Nikki about that. We need this conversation, Nikki. Uh, and I, yeah, I, sure. Uh, by all means. I managed to get a, um, a, a second-hand electric bike, so I'm absolutely thrilled. So I've got one at home. Uh, as well. Well. Well, nice. really <laughs> That's good stuff. Uh, our next question is from Grant, probably for Ian and Tess. Uh, are there any problems with urban permaculture and air pollution? If plants remove pollution from the air, does pollution accumulate in the fruits, etc.? Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to be eating fruit right next to the a busy road. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. And in, actually in Plymouth anyway, we've got so much open green space. Um, this, the council has huge areas of green space, so I don't think we need to eat uh, fruit from very close to very busy roads. Um, so on the, I would err on the side of caution and say, um, you know, e even just having some sort of barrier. We did a, a wild food walk at um, from the the art centre a few years ago um, in um, in Lou Street. And I brought an ecologist with me called uh, Ro Hughes, who's uh, great. And we were looking at some walls and behind, on one side of the walls, there was none of this plant, um, a little, uh, little fern that grows, which it won't grow where there's traffic. But the other side of the wall, this plant was growing everywhere because it was okay. So, you know, just having a wall between can um, make it much safer. Yeah. And I, I think another interesting scheme on that, um, is Wingfield Wood by Delahaye Avenue there in Stoke in Plymouth, um, which is right beside the railway line. Um, but again, um, you know, I, th I think that that's fine if it's if it's not right by the traffic um, and isn't yeah. isn't getting smoked and affected by it that way. Uh, I think it, it it gets fairly clean only a few feet or yards mm. away. It, it it you know uh, I don't think there's much of an issue there really from that perspective. Mm. Um, as long as it's not right by the exhaust pipes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, things growing low might get splashed by the salt and things like that. You know, but, um, mm. but then you've got the other worry about uh, you know, picking and foraging and things like that. As um, you know, in the parks and things, be careful where the dogs have been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just need to be careful. But I think a bit of common sense on that is what yeah. you need. Yeah. Common sense. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, Question for you, Nikki. A couple of people asking about your photo of rural parades, uh, and some oh, yeah? in the chat 
to Royal Parade uh, when it was constructed. Um, mm -hmm. They're saying, you know, have you got any plans at the moment? Any chance of getting rid of the barriers, restoring the grass down the middle? Uh, they've seen uh, reference somewhere to the possibility of uh, vehicles other than buses being removed heritage action zone sort of thing yeah so um royal parade over the years has gone through massive transformation there's been there's been barriers there's been low barriers there's been no barriers there's been little hedges lot you know lots of it lots of things and um you know this is sort of an example i think about how thinking sort of changes changes over time and you know like um you know, it's all about keeping people's perception of keeping people safe yeah. um and i think um yeah you're right there is um there is some sort of um, option analysis happening at the moment about um, about Royal Parade and what um, what the future of Royal Parade could look like, and you know everything's on the table. You know, like it's 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 about like looking at what the streets doing now for people and what it's doing, and what it could do in the future. Yeah, Matley Plain as well. Agree, yeah. Christina. Um, and yeah, just to say that, you know, like, yeah, like I say, thinking, thinking changes and times change. And, you know, maybe yeah. it is time that these things are addressed holistically and, you know, across the city. So, yeah, there is, we're on it. <laughs> That's great. Um, and this, this is a question from, um, we don't have an answer to this one, but it's a good, it's a good point. I've seen this as well. And I think it's great. Brewdog Beer have an initiative when you scan the QR code at the bottom of the pack of beer, they plant a tree for you. Trees, uh, the tree is in their own forest in Scotland. Would be good if they did this in a nominated place. Maybe they could be persuaded into fund microforests. Have you guys heard of any other great initiatives like that? I'd heard about that idea that Brew Dog and you know the guys. You know, fair play to him. He's a he is a disruptor in his own market, and he's and this is yet another another idea he's come up with that's innovative and disruptive and challenging i think it's brilliant and he's actually putting his money where his mouth is he's bought the land um you know so clearly we're all drinking enough of his beer but interestingly i will be one of the first people going into his pub i'm not necessarily into lager but i'll be going there to raise a pint because it's just a great idea hmm. fair play to him i think it's brilliant we need a plymouth beer maybe well there yeah. there, there was because i was supporting the billy ruffians which was using it was from the ideas organization that we're using oh, yes. from the, the Devonport, um, uh, where they had the bakehouse there in Devonport Guildhall, um, brewing with the waste products coming out of that uh, in a very similar way. But I think, sadly, mm. COVID snookered the whole bakery side, and I think Billy Ruffians is kind of hanging in the air at the moment. But please keep an eye out for that, and I'll try and tip you off uh, if and when it uh, goes through a resurgence. But it was using the brew kit um, that's at City College Plymouth, um, um, which has been there and has had gone through several iterations, but it was being backed by uh, Summer Skills, uh, by Norman from Summer Skills there, Summer Skills Brewery. Great. Yeah, so keep, keep you posted. posted. <laughs> <laughs> that, one. that seems really interesting. Uh, and just following, finally, just following on from our um, plant uh, talk earlier, it, Christina asked, is there any good option for something in a large pot? Uh, our front garden is not really much of a garden. It's probably got a bit of a, a courtyard at the front. Is there anything that you would suggest, Stephen Adam? Well, yeah, back to my favourite tree again, the Amalankia. You can you can get that as a multi-stemmed form, put it in a pot, will survive beautifully in that. Um, so, yeah, Steve, I don't know if you've got any other suggestions. Um, depends on the size of the pot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, there's numerous shrubs I could suggest, and it's things so to create a habitat for birds. It's, you know, for tinea is a lovely shrub for uh, uh, good structure. Um, you could use uh, it depends if you want to be more formal. So you'd use cloud tree type sort of planting. Um, why am I going blank when I'm being asked a question about horticulture? Um, <laughs> I've got an idea. Yeah, I mean the fatinia is good because it's a, it's an evergreen. Um, but you you know you could even use native species like a um, a multi stand or a, a contorted willow or hazel. Yeah. Sorry, not the willow. That's a bit big, but you can use, certainly use a contorted hazel. Um, they're a great tree, um, and you can get various coloured forms of those as well. So you can get a purple one or a yellow one or a, a green one. 
So there's, um, there's a few options. Cornus is, is a great plant, multi, multi-colored stems of that always look great in the pot. I'm, I'm if, just if reading just, there. Sorry, sorry. So I'm just reading in the notes there from Sarah. Mm. She's saying that her local council and accept Hammerland here on landscape plans mm. is registered as invasive. Okay. Um, yeah. I've never heard of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. I, if I could just come in there, um, Amalankia, um, uh, the other name I, I use for it is Duneberry, and it's actually oh, got um, yeah. wonderful edible um, berries as well. And if you, even if you don't particularly like the berries, the other benefit is that once that's um, fruiting, the birds prefer that to your raspberries and your, your <laughs> currants. So it's quite a good um, treat for that. And the other thing I would suggest, um, if you didn't want something too big, um, you could do a June berry, not so June blueberries. Um, you might um, want a, a couple of um, two or three pots with them, but they are really productive in a pot, and you can give them the right um, type of soil, and they're really, um, you know, really nice, easy plant with lots of. You've got the flowers, and you've got colourful leaves at the end, um, so that might be a choice. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Some great tips there. Uh, we've got. Actually, we'll one more we'll do one more question we've got time for one more and then the results of our uh, quiz uh, from chris steve adam uh chris here from no carbon devon what's your biggest ambition for plymouth how much of plymouth can we cover in greenery for example green walls and roofs as well and parks and gardens 60 70 percent what's your what's your ambition Wherever there's an opportunity, we would like to see something green. So a lot of the city centre has got flat roofs. Um, people say, hang on, we've got all the services on there. We've got um, uh, photovoltaics, we've got air conditioners, etc. But there's no reason that we can't do biosolar. So that's mixing um, green roofs with uh, solar panels. So that, that's a concept that would be great to see. Green walls, we don't do enough of them. I know the university is pioneering some ideas there, which is great. Um, but yeah, wherever we get a space, you know, and I'm, we're talking about microforests, but they don't have to be a perfect square or a circle. They can be linear features. So you could put them around the edges of, of sports pitches or, or playing fields. Um, you could put them along verges if they're big enough and they don't obstruct, obstruct visibility displays and things like that. So I, I think wherever you've got an opportunity, we, we, need to, we need to challenge what's been done before and we need to challenge you know, all the rules and regs that we currently go by because they're often totally against um, any green infrastructure. So you, you take the road up to uh, Derriford at the moment, um, which goes up to past b and I mean, the, the central reserves there have been concreted in. I yes. mean- and all the trees have been taken out. I mean, that sort of goes against everything we're, we're, we're saying today. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, I think it's a crazy idea. And I know why it's been done, because it's all about health and safety. Um, it's perceived as being unsafe. But is it really? I don't think so. You know, I think we should challenge these um, a lot harder than we currently do, because we're missing huge opportunities for all the benefits that trees provide us with. So I'll get off my soapbox now. So in answer to your, to answer your question, Chris, and I think you, we, we've met and in numerous cases, you know we're both really passionate about this. And, you know, aside from all the environmental stuff and the, the well-being, it's just going to make our wonderful ocean city even better to visit. Let's, you know, let's be that city that is just a go-to place for the right mm. reasons and to add yeah. to what we've already offer. It's just, it's just, it's just a no-brainer. And the amount of development and the climate emergency, all of this is creating this real cocktail of opportunity for us to make a real difference over the next 20 years. And we don't want it to just be talk. We want to do something about it. And we've got to do it now because we'll have missed the boat in five years time. Um, That's a really good point, Adam. You know, we really don't want this to be talk. Uh, and please um, keep the conversation going. We've set up a LinkedIn page. So please, everybody join that. We've also got a, um, a Twitter as well, uh, Future Plymouth 2030. Please follow us. Let's, let's make a difference. Let's, let's make Plymouth amazing. Um, so thank, thank you so much, everyone, today. I'll leave it to you, Adam and Steve, to pick the winner and the, and the answer to the quiz. Well, thanks, Miles, and thank you for everyone who contributed. Um, 
I'm just, I couldn't find a, a button for drum roll, so I'll just get straight to it. Based on, uh, you know, based on a, the specification provided, the installation cost would be estimated about £8,300. So we had three people. So congratulations to Harriet Fuller, Hattie Thompson and Rebecca Dixon. Uh, and in the interest of what we're talking about, which is doing a bit more, I'm going to uh, ensure that you all get a tree each. Uh, so, um, and thank you, Mark, Marie, Louise, uh, for your uh, bit of fun. I've enjoyed the, uh, the challenge uh, uh, and uh, I've also um, enjoyed the opportunity to share, the, share this whole idea about the microforest with Adam and yourselves. It's been a really interesting and, and hopefully interesting to all of you as well. Amazing. Thank and you sorry, so much. Sorry, 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 sorry. I did also say we would be very interested in following this up with a a uh, questionnaire. Miles, if I could ask, if I could send that to you, could you pass that out to everyone who's attended today? We really do need to get an appetite. We need to have an understanding of the appetite for this to, to work. Yeah, of course. Thank of course, you, that'd be brilliant. Send it over. Thank you so much, guys. And enjoy your trees, the winners. That's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Um, please join us for our next webinar, May the 5th. Same time, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. for health and well-being. Uh, until next time, thanks very much, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That you're taught to hold your breath All those words that I think I said I meant to you before we left And the way you move in the summertime All those things that refuse to shine above And you Complete me sometimes Sometimes